slick things, the needy things, and the impossible things. My cup running over this morning. Yes, it does. To the pastor of this fine assembly, Pastor Robert Tilton and Susan Tilton, to all of the preachers and teachers, evangelists, to the deacons, and especially to you, the faithful in Christ Jesus. In this message this morning, I need to hold two texts together because one of them is the key to the other. So if you have your Bibles uh, with you, let's start with Romans, the first chapter and the 17th verse. Romans, the first chapter and the 17th verse. And then I want to draw your attention to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, the first chapter, the first to the fourth verses. Then Habakkuk, the second chapter, the first to the fourth verses. And it'll be in that order. And for your hearing and your meditation, I'm going to be reading to you from the Amplified Bible. First of all, let's hear Paul. Let's hear the words of Paul according to Romans, the first chapter and the 17th verse. And it reads as thus. For in the gospel, a righteousness which God ascribes, which credits or signs, is revealed both springing from faith and leading to faith, disclosed through the way of faith that arouses to more faith. This last part of the verse when Paul says, as it is written, the man who through faith is just and upright shall live and shall live by faith. Paul is quoting from the Old Testament, actually the book of Habakkuk. Turn with me now to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, the first chapter, the first to the fourth verse, and then we're going to look at Habakkuk, the second chapter, the first to the fourth. The burden of the oracle, the thing to be lifted up, which Habakkuk the prophet saw. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry out to you of violence, and you will not save? Why do you show me iniquity and wrong, and yourself look upon or cause me to see perverseness and trouble? For destruction and violence are before me, and there is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is slackened, and justice, and a righteous sentence never go forth, for the hostility of the wicked surrounds the uncompromisingly righteous. Therefore, justice goes forth, perverted, corrupt. Habakkuk, the second chapter, the first to the fourth verse. Oh, I know, God, I've been rash. I've been reckless. I've been impulsive to talk out plainly this way to God. I will in my thinking stand up on my post of observation and station myself on the tower of the fortress and will watch to see what he will say within me and what answer I will make as his mouthpiece to the perplexities of my complaint against him. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and engrave it so plainly upon tablets that everyone who passes may be able to read it easily and quickly as he hastens by. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, and it hastens to the end fulfillment. It will not deceive or disappoint. Though it tarry, wait earnestly for it, because it will surely come. It will not be behind hand on its appointed day. Look at the proud. His soul is not straight or right within him, but the rigidly just and the uncompromisingly righteous man shall live by his faith and in his faithfulness. And I love the King James Version that would say, for the just shall live by faith. I want to use, though, for a subject today, the certainty of God in an uncertain world. Will you pray with me? Almighty God and gracious Father, there is no preacher but you, Lord. Lord, there is no word but your word, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, according to Matthew, the fourth chapter and the fourth verse. 
Then, God, there is no interpreter but your Holy Spirit, which leads us into all truth, according to John, the 16th chapter, 13th verse. Hide now your handmaid servant, God. Touch these lips of clay. Let my words evaporate, God, so that your word may be made plain. And then, Father, let my presence here today be of no importance so that your presence may be everything. Father, I thank you now that so shall thy word be that go forth out of my mouth that shall not return to you void, but shall accomplish that which you please and prosper wherein the thing it is sent. In Jesus' name, amen. We live in a world with a lot of uncertainties. Things that we thought were unshakable and unmovable have been dislodged and even removed. Our world today is filled with uncertainty. When I think about it, on any given day, we awake up to news regarding terrorists, weather disasters, news regarding economic issues, Great Britain now, places like Russia, places like China, or some other major place in the world, and those issues cause the economies of the rest of the first world nations to shudder and shake. And then add to that news a level of uncertainty regarding our own nation's economy. And now again, we face more uncertainties as we get ready to cast our votes again for the new presidency. Then all of us have continued to be shocked by the violence in this world, even in our own communities, even among people we have known and by certain things that have happened this year alone. Things are happening in this world, in our nation, in our communities faster than we can comprehend. So I want to bring this to our attention to show you the book of Habakkuk today, to show you how relevant to show you how significant God's word is in general. And the book of Habakkuk specifically, that God may grow our faith and endurance as we listen to Habakkuk. Now very little in the Bible is known about Habakkuk, the eighth of the minor prophets. We know nothing about his tribe, we know nothing about his family or even his birthplace. However, we know that the penman of this book was a man divinely inspired and commissioned by God. And for me, that's enough. And what makes this book so unusual is that it takes the form of a dialogue or a conversation between God and the prophet Habakkuk. Another thing that's unusual about this book is that Habakkuk does not speak to men under God's commission as do other prophets. But Habakkuk speaks about his people and their enemies directly to God. And this is certainly not the only time now in the Bible that this has happened because when we think of Abraham defending the city of Sodom, but no other book, I believe, has an extended debate with God as this small, short book of only three chapters as Habakkuk. Now that brings me to the situation at hand. It is believed that Habakkuk may have witnessed the decline and the fall of the Assyrian Empire and the rise of Babylon Kingdom, also called the Chaldeans under Nebuchadnezzar, and you know how mean and nasty he was, rising to a place of supremacy. And at this time in the Bible, there were turbulent and uncertain times in Judah. There were times of spiritual delinquency and injustice. The righteous were being oppressed. Violence and wickedness, hatred, and outbreaks of evil was on an all-time high. And this sounds much like where we are living today. It sounds much like our nation's condition today. Because we too live in a divided and an unequal world. 
divided between the rich and the poor, divided between the have and the have-nots. And people are so mean and so mean-spirited now that the milk of human kindness is almost gone. Habakkuk finds himself troubled. The King James Version said he finds himself burdened. He's burdened because he saw the righteous suffering and the wicked prospering. So he asked God the question that rings out across the centuries through every generation that all of us ask sooner or later. And if you haven't asked it, you will. And that question is, Lord, why are these things happening? And Lord, how long will it be before you do something about it? Just as we struggle with the issues in our own world, our own communities with crime and joblessness, homelessness, the cost of living, and it looks like God is not doing anything about our circumstances. One area, though, I think that we have failed in in the body of Christ as he preaches and evangelists and teachers, perhaps, and I don't think it's just, just all of our fault, but we have to take uh, credit for it, too, is to teach people how to be prepared for a real walk with God and that much of life is indeed a mystery. You know, some years ago, we heard all of the uh, prosper, uh, prosperity messages, name it and claim it. You can have it if you want it. You, you remember? All on the radio. And it didn't really teach people how to be prepared for a real walk with God. Allowing people to think that God was a Santa Claus and that his function was just to give us everything that we wanted, when we wanted, and however we wanted it. And as a result, we have raised a generation of people a lot in a lot of our parishes and assemblies that cannot deal with delayed gratification. You know it to be true. Then note Matthew, the seventh chapter and the 11th verse. Listen to this. God said, if you then evil as you are, know how to give good and advantageous gifts to your children, how much more will your father, who is in heaven, perfect as he is, give good and advantageous things to those who keep on asking him. I want to give you one more scripture. Mama Susan always quotes this scripture. It comes from James, the first chapter and the 17th verse. And she always reminds us that every good and every perfect gift come from above. And that is so true. But consider this. Have you ever thought of trials and tribulation as part of God's good and perfect gifts? Think about it. No, we don't think like that. We don't think in those terms. But guess what? It can be, and they are, and they have been. You see, we forget that our perseverance, we forget that our endurance in trials produces maturity and fruitfulness. And that God allows us to be in whatever situation or even crisis we may be in for a reason. To mold us, to shape us for the master's service. Yes, he does. God works in our lives in so many ways that sometimes we even miss it. When I think of his intervention, have you ever been in a crisis, and this has happened to me, have you ever been in a crisis and it looks bad and you have no idea how you are going to get out of it? You have no idea uh, if it's a final, how you are going to come up with the money. You have no idea what you are going to do, you can't see your way out. You can't call nobody. 
You don't have good credit. You don't know nobody to call. You don't know what to do. Have you ever been in that kind of sense? Your back is against the wall. And you don't know what you're going to do. Have you ever been in that kind of crisis? And then guess what? You prayed about it. And you actually turned it over to Jesus. And while you were worrying about it, he had already worked it out. God changed the circumstance. Have you been there? And he changed the circumstance and did something that only you knew that he could do and nobody else could do it. Can I get a witness? I'm a witness. That happened to me many times. But you see, much of our problem in this human frail body, we get frustrated and we get frustrated because of our human assumptions we make how we think God will and should act. Oh, yes. Because we think we are smart. I don't know why. We think we are so wise. And we long for sensibility. It doesn't make sense. Sometimes God does not make sense. We seek explanation. Well, why? Why did he do it like this? We are desperate for reason because we think we're wise and smart. And that was another problem that Habakkuk had. And that was a problem that he faced. I want you to know that God is a prayer answering God. Can I get a witness out here? I know he is. Jeremiah 33 and 3 said, Call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things, fenced in and hidden, which you do not know, do not distinguish and recognize and have knowledge of and understand. But sometimes when God answers, it is not the response sometimes that we want to hear. Can I get a witness? God did answer Habakkuk. And you see, Habakkuk had been praying for a long time. And God had been silent for a long time. And when God answered Habakkuk, in Habakkuk, the first chapter and the fifth verse, God revealed to Habakkuk that the Babylonians called the Chaldeans the epitome of everything he detested and hated <laughs> would become God's instrument of judgment against Judah. Because we know Judah, the children of Israel, had been disobedient. We know that. And you know we have been disobedient. Look at our nation. We've taken God out of everything took him out of the school. He's out of everything. And then now we're wondering what's happened, what's going on. Duh. Really? Really? We've only set him aside after every tragedy. It, it, it's sad. We talked about this, I think, last week in our ladies' class. We only set God aside only when we need him. After every episode, crisis, whatever happens, then we, we want everybody in the world to pray and pray for us. <laughs> I, I, I mean, seriously, we do. We don't need you now. We'll get you, we'll call you when you need to God. We'll take you off the shelf, dust you off, sit up there. We're doing our thing now, but now when something happens, we're going to call you. That's our attitude. So now Habakkuk has been revealed by God that he's going to use 
the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, nasty Nebuchadnezzar, and they were gruesome, just like ISIS. Yes, they were. Now Habakkuk is really burdened because he cannot understand why God, God really? Why would you allow a more wicked people to judge Judah, who is a much less? God, we're better than they are. So the problem that Habakkuk is experiencing in our text is that he needs a different perspective. Yes, he does. You know, we always think that we're so deserving. God, we are not as bad as they are. But do you know sin is sin? There ain't no degrees. There's no variation. Disobedience is disobedient. And disobedience separates us from a holy God. So now Habakkuk, has got to look at this thing in a different way because, I mean, I can't understand why God is doing it this way. Because after all, I'm wise and I'm smart. I wouldn't have done it that way. <laughs> you see, we view life and things much different than God. For one thing, we can only see what is immediately in front of us, but God sees all of life at one glance. He sees both the beginning and the end of things while we see only the present. That's all you see. Isaiah, the 46th chapter and 10th verse says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient time, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I do all that I please. I want to tell you something else. God governs by his divine providence. And I know it's going to be part two just because it's just too much that I need to tell you. But God's divine providence is uh, the doctrine stands in to tell us that, that God is in control over everything. Yeah. Everything. He is sovereign over the universe as a whole, physical, over the affairs of nations, over the affairs of men, over the affairs of nature, over the affairs of everything. And how is it related? God hates sin. Yes, he does. And he'll judge sin. God is not the author of sin. He does not tempt anyone to sin according to James 1 and 13. You know that. And he does not condone sin. But at the same time, God obviously allows a certain measure of sin because he must have a reason for allowing it. He said all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord. Who are the called according to his purpose? Did he not? And let me tell you one thing. I want to give you an example of God's divine providence in Scripture. And then I'm going to move on. Think about God's divine providence and scriptures found. Think about Joseph. Now God allowed Joseph uh, brothers to kidnap him. Did he not? They sold him as a slave. They lied to their father for years about his faith. And we know that this was wicked and God was displeased. Yet at the same time, all of their sin work taught a greater good. Joseph ended up in Egypt where he was made the prime minister. Joseph used his position to sustain the people of a broad region during a seven-year famine, including his own family. And if Joseph had not been in Egypt before the famine began, millions of people including the Israelites, would have died. How did God get Joseph to Egypt? His providentially divine governance. He allowed his brothers the freedom 
to sin. God's divine providence is directly acknowledged in the book of Genesis, the 50th chapter, the 50 to the 21st verse. It was allowed to happen because God had a plan. What the devil meant for bad, God had already planned it to be good. Amen. He's a good God. He's a good God. I told you we long for sensibility and sometimes God doesn't make sense because we seek explanation and we're so desperate for reason. So let me tell you this. Understanding God is enormous, never ending challenge. And as God's people, we must not live by circumstance. We must not live by sight. We got to live by faith. I'm getting ready to leave you, but even though Habakkuk was confused and he was burdened and he refused, though, to waver, he knew and he felt that he was a little hard on God, that he was wrong the way he said to God, God, why aren't you doing anything? That's what he actually said. I mean, all these things are happening. And I can't believe that you're allowing these things to happen. And you're not doing nothing. Well, let me tell you what I love about God. Is that he knows our hearts and our hearts' desires. And let me tell you what about his children. He don't get insulted. Daddy don't get insulted. He doesn't get offended when we lack understanding. No, he doesn't. He's not like man. According to James, the first chapter, in the fifth verse, God said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of the giving God who gives to everyone freely and ungrudgingly without finding fault, and it will be given. And another thing I love about God, the certainty of a God, is that he knows us individually. Yeah. Psalms 139 said he has searched us and he knows us. He knows our down sitting and our uprising. He understands our thoughts are far off. He's acquainted not with some of our ways, but he is acquainted with each and every last one of us individually, all of our ways. And then he said, there is not a word on our tongue before we speak it that he doesn't know it completely. He know what you're going to say even before you say it. He know what you're thinking before you've thought it. He knows all about us. Well, after a little talk with Jesus, you know, it makes everything all right. Habakkuk began to gain a different perspective because I'm reminded of Philippians, the fourth chapter, the sixth through the seventh verse, said, be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Pastor quoted that this morning. Brother Rick uh, preached on that some months ago. Might have been a year ago, but I never forgot it. In other words, after you have a little talk with Jesus and you have turned it over to Jesus and allowed him to work it out. In other words, you will experience, I'm a witness to this, God's peace, which exceeds anything that you may be able to understand. After a little talk with Jesus, I'm reminded that Habakkuk must have realized after he talked with Jesus and felt pretty good. He had a little peace now, and he was able to look at things in a different perspective. And in my own mind, I see that he said, well, 
I may not understand your time in God. I may not understand why it looks like that you're not doing anything or haven't done anything. But I know one thing, you're too wise to make a mistake. Round the third chapter, the 17th through the 19th verse, Habakkuk affirmed one of the most powerful prayers of praise to the Lord. You may read it when you get home, but in other words, the bottom line of his explanation was that even if everything he relied on failed, if everything that gave stability to his life crumbled, Habakkuk said, yet will I rejoice in the Lord God of my salvation, that the Lord was my strength, the Lord was my personal bravery, that the Lord was my invincible army, that the Lord would make my feet like hind's feet, that means stable and firm, that he'd make me to walk, not to stand still in terror, but to walk and make spiritual progress upon my high place of trouble or responsibility. And it reminds me of the praise that I love to say, no matter what, I will bless the Lord at all times, in good times, in times of lack, in times of difficulty and sadness, I will bless the Lord at all. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah. The certainty of God. Conclusion, I want to say that God may use some very strange instruments even now as he's using. Let me tell you, God uses everything. The wicked don't have no power over God. Thine is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. All that is in heaven and all that is earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, and thou art exalted as head over all. They're only ringing for a little while. God is using them for whatever purpose to draw us to our knees. He knows how to awaken his people to repent and to be faithful. Things are not what they appear to be. God is in control, and every person and everything is under the hand of God. Yes, it is. God is no stranger to crisis. The same God who moved in history is involved in the present hour, and he's able to handle any crisis that we may be going through. Yes, he is. The Lord is saying to me today and he's saying to you, it's time for us to wake up. Time for us to look up. Time for us to straighten up. It's time for us to speak up in Jesus' name. Not in my name, but in the name of Jesus. And he has a purpose for everything that he is allowing to happen. God is calling his church. He's calling us to stand on the wall. He's calling us to stand our watch. He's calling us to stand just as Habakkuk stood on the wall. Pray. Pray all the time. Pray for the nation. Pray for the country. Pray. Pray, 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 and more prayer. Because today's news, good or bad, is bound up with God's kingdom. That's why, let me tell you what, I don't care what it looked like in the natural. I shall not speak discouragement. Oh no. When God said that my past has been forgiven, my future is secure in Jesus. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and the power of my testimony. That's my future. You ought to give him some praise. I don't know about you, but I know one thing. I'm certain about him. I have the assurance of God. I know what he can do and I know what he will do. And I know one thing, he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that I may ask or think, according to power that works in me. And that power is his Holy Spirit. And I know one thing, that when I fall, he lifts me up. When I fail, he has forgiven me. When I've been weak, he's been strong. He's been my God. He's been my peace. He's been my joy. One thing about it, the world can't understand him. The devil can't defeat him. The schools can't explain him. The leaders can't ignore him. The Pharisees could not confuse him. They could not. 
He is still the great I am. He is still the God on our side. And in the end, everything will work out for our good because whoever is on the side of the great I am is good. And I want to let you know that even when you can't see his hand, even when he's silent, and even when you don't understand what he's doing behind the scenes, when you can't trace his hand, let me tell you, be certain and be assured that you could trust his heart. And his heart is in his word. Be blessed. Working. Working. Okay. Well.